This is part three of topic four on electrical behavior and diffusion in materials. What I'd like to talk about next is the difference between intrinsic semiconductors and extrinsic semiconductors. Intrinsic semiconductors are those that we've already talked about, silicon, germanium, arsenic. They have a natural temperature dependent conductivity of materials. In other words, they don't conduct electricity very well because they have a moderately sized band gap. But if I add thermal energy to the system by heating up the material, I can get it to conduct more electricity. That's called intrinsic semiconductor behavior. But there's another type of semiconductor behavior called extrinsic. And by extrinsic, what we're doing is, is we dope the semiconductor with impurity elements. Doping is the word we use when we say we put impurity elements in a semiconductor. Alloying is the word we use when we talk about putting impurity elements in a metal. The advantage of doping is you get smaller energy jumps that are needed for conduction. In other words, you shrink the size of the band gap. There are two types of extrinsic semiconductors, n-type and p-type, and we'll discuss each of these in a second. Now, what's important to recognize is that small amounts of dopants, let's say one part per million, can have dramatic effects on the number of free electrons in the material, as much as five orders of magnitude increase. That's an amazing change in the conductivity of a material. Let's look first at n-type semiconductors. These are semiconductors made by doping with group 5 elements such as phosphorus and arsenic, phosphorus being one of the most common. What happens is by adding phosphorus and arsenic is you add an extra electron with the impurity element. Because silicon is group 4, meaning it has normally 4 electrons in its valence band, I add a phosphorus impurity element and I get a fifth electron present. That fifth electron occupies what's called the donor state in the band gap. And the donor state is typically at a high energy level close to the conduction band. And what happens then is if I provide a little bit of excitation through thermal energy, and this can happen easily at room temperature, the electron jumps from the donor state into the conduction band and becomes a free electron capable of carrying electrical charge. So in this case, what we call the majority charge carriers are electrons. A p-type semiconductor is made by a group 3 dopant, such as boron. Now group 3 dopants have only 3 electrons in their valence shell, so they're deficient in one electron. The effect of this is to create something called the acceptor state, just above the valence band inside the band gap. Now, an electron can jump from the valence band into the acceptor state, and what happens is you leave behind a hole in the valence band. This, valence, this hole excuse me, now becomes the majority charge carrier. It seems a little strange, but the missing electron, or hole, actually conducts a positive current in the opposite direction that we would normally see current flowing in. So how do I dope semiconductors? Well, there's two commonly used methods. One is ion implantation, where I bombard the surface of a piece of silicon with, say, for example, boron ions. Or another approach is to use the gas phase, where I put a boron gas above the silicon and let the gas, uh, the boron atoms, gradually diffuse into the silicon material beneath it. In either case, you get very localized and very thin layers of boron inside the silicon and they can be highly concentrated all the way up to the solubility limit of boron in silicon. So the question then becomes what factors control the rate of doping and this has to do with diffusion. One quick check. What kind of semiconductor are we looking at here? An n-type or a p-type? If you said this was an n-type you're correct. What is the major charge carrier for an n-type semiconductor? If you said free electron, you're also correct. Remember that an n-type semiconductor has an extra electron in the donor state, shown here at the top of the band gap. That extra electron has the ability to jump into the conduction band easily and become a free electron, thus carrying charge just as a metal or any other conductive material would do.